uh, yeah, let me, um, but if we do, um, what we're seeing is that it, it is actually smart investing based on what we're seeing. It, you are not giving up portfolio performance um, based on the best practices. It is actually better for your portfolio and for the for the planet to do this. So that's the, the, the main thing I want you to take away. Um, the other thing, people are probably going to be at all different like uh, places in their investment education. You know, they may have like a sophisticated you know, wealth management portfolio in which that's like aligned with like their retirement goals and their midterm goals. Some people may be really new to it. Um, so my hope is that I'll be able to cover, you know, both the sophisticated parts of it and and the the parts that help bring people into the new area. So with that, I'll share my screen. <clears throat> All right. All right, there we go. And can everybody see my screen? All right. So, Breen, before thing. you before you get into it, just one thing: uh, yeah. if you if you all have questions, uh, we will definitely have a, a robust Q and A uh, at the end. So, just hold them, uh, write them down, think them, and then we will uh, we will uh, Breen will uh, uh, have a Q and A session with you guys uh, towards the end. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Lou. Um, the, the key thing is we can't solve climate change with how we invest. This was really born out of the realization of Project Drawdown's work that we have the vast majority of technology necessary to solve climate change. So if we have the technology to solve climate change, what do we really need to do? And that's to invest so that all these technologies can grow and scale more. Um, that can be done in a number of ways, right? It can be through the government, um, you know, incentivizing policy. They've just done that with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which has a bunch of tax credits. Um, it can be through like private um, investors, sometimes really big investors, and also everyday investors like all of us. Um, but that's that's the key thing. Um, and when it comes down to the science is saying we need to invest like zero dollars in, into expanding fossil fuel extraction and about $5 trillion a year in invested in climate solutions. But the standard portfolios out there, um, they don't align with that reality at all. Um, basic, and we use Vanguard here because over the last 40 years, they've come to define what is smart investing. Um, and I'll get into like what is smart investing as well. Um, but they invest about, you know, eight, like a little over 8% into fossil fuels and only about, you know, a little under 4% into climate solutions. So you can see this is, there's a big misalignment. <clears throat> and um, this, this is like going into finding a portfolio where you don't have to do any of the, the work. You just go to like Betterment or Wealthfront, you sign up, you start investing, you know, $100 uh, a month or or maybe you put your whole portfolio in when like what they're putting your money in um, still continues to have high levels of fossil fuels, even if it's like the climate impact. Betterment's climate impact um, portfolio has 5% fossil fuels. Um, and this is largely due to the fact that the products that these much larger investment companies are making, they're not built around uh, solving climate change. They're not built around um, like the environment as a, as a really major risk factor. So today I'm gonna to try to make it a little bit easier for you. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about like why your investments matter, um, you know, what it does, just to give some people like an idea how to be a smart investor. There's some myths of sustainable investing, um, tools to build your own portfolio, depending on like where you are in your investment journey. And then what our conclusions have been at Carbon Collective. So you can get a sense of like, how we how we do things. Um, first and foremost, uh, past performance does that guarantee future results. Um, investing inherently is a belief statement in the future, um, but no one really knows what the future is going to happen like exactly. And so it's more about um, using our um, our knowledge as best we can to continue to invest smarter. So part one, why investing matters. Uh, <laughs> Every time you own a stock it is like a, having citizenship in a very weird democracy, um, an extremely weird democracy. Um, and this was really signaled uh, in the news 
when Exxon had um, a group uh, get three climate friendly uh, board members on their board. That that is a huge deal. Um, and so they were able to start to get um, people that would potentially influence. That hasn't changed Exxon a whole lot, and it's maybe not the way we would use shareholder advocacy. Um, but it's a really good example of like read like helping people reimagine what's possible and remembering that you get to vote when you have a share. The second thing is cost of capital. Um, this is a little bit more arcane. You know, it's it's uh, maybe hard to understand if you haven't been familiar with uh, eco economics. But the basic idea is um, it. <sighs> If you have something that is growing really fast, people believe there's less risk in helping you continue to grow. And so that and so what that equates to um, when you get into the, the financial markets is if your poor, if your stock prices is going up, um, then banks will be more likely to lend you money at a good rate so you can go put that to use to help grow your business. They're going to see you as less of a risk that you'll be more likely to pay off your debts. And so that is what cost of capital is. And that could be really significant. Um, some of you may be looking, you know, I like, you know, Michelle, your your mom, um, you know, Brent, you you maybe have a home. Like if you're buying a home now and you're getting a like getting a mortgage, you can afford less because um because mortgage rates are higher. And that's an example of cost of capital. And that same thing happens to big businesses. They they're always trying to figure out how to grow. And if they can get cheaper money. Um, that be can be really helpful in, in getting them to grow fast. An example of this is um, Plug Power ended up was able to raise a hundred or one billion dollars in financing, which is means a loan for U.S. green hydro hydrogen infrastructure. So the better the better the stock price does, you know, it allows them to do things like this. Also, narrative is really important. Um, coal is a really good example. We continue to use coal, but Seeing that coal is a really, um, it, it's terrible for the environment, but also a bad business. It caused the collapse of the U.S. coal um, of the U.S. coal market. So the U.S. coal index over the last you know ten plus years has dropped ninety nine percent. That's a that's a really bad investment. And so what that has done is it's put coal on a pathway to being. Um, economically non-viable and that's really impactful to to get that off the market um so those those are the three areas that we see are really really important now how to be a smart investor there's three basic concepts that i i hope you can take away there are, are there's much more detail so if you have more questions please feel free to ask me them um but i'm going to do my, the best i can to make it as simple as possible um one is to invest with the market. And this is like the general theme that will cover the, the other two things that I talked to you about. Um, so a lot of people, when they start to think about investing, they'll be like, oh, I'm picking a stock, right? And that is fun. You get to learn about the market, you get to follow it going up and down. But if you look at it, there's so many smart people investing and trying to see like which investment is no one thinking about that now the system is more valuable than the individual stocks. So it's actually smarter to just invest with the market. Um, and that's what's called passive investing. Um, Vanguard has really helped define that over the last 45, 50 years. Um, and what you see is that, you know, very few funds outperform the S&P 500 over five years. And the, the stats get even um, more exaggerated when you go to 10 and 20 years. Um, so th that's it. Invest with the market. Your indexes that you hear on the radio, the S&P 500 was up or down. Um, that That is what we call the market. Diversify. Um, so this is about, uh, you know, it, it's not just a, about styles, but it's all, which would be, you know, in here they have like large cap, uh, which would be like really big companies, really small companies that are publicly traded, international companies. Um, you're looking at companies that like have a high growth path, other companies that, um, they don't grow as much, but they pay a dividend. It's kind of like getting rent, um, for a stock. Um, you know, there might be companies that are better protected from inflation, um, 
So they're called TIFs, they're inflation protected bonds. Um, there might be defensive. Um, and so like there's been like that's in the stock market, but also making sure you have a balance of stocks and bonds, right? So that that's what we think in terms of diversification. And then as low fees as possible. Um, we think about this a lot at Carbon Collective. So we try to charge as low fees as we can because we know that eats into returns. And we're just trying to charge the fees that will allow us to um, kind of continue our mission, right? Um, so this is a really good example here. I got all your videos on this side. So let me just move it over. Um, so this is an example of what happens to an advisory fee, right? So the S&P 500 and then a, the S&P 500 with a 0.5% uh, percent, uh, advisory fee. And over the course of 25 years, that's a difference in about, you know, 90 percentage points. So that's a pretty significant difference, even on something that's just a little bit. Um, now you have to have, like, it's pretty hard to get away from fees completely, but that's, that's why it's important to look at how low the fees are. Now I want to go through a few myths that people have been talking about, um, Sometimes people talk about, you know, is sustainable investing charity, right? Or fossil fuels are necessary, you know, for your portfolio. These are common things that you'll hear from financial advisors. So some of you who are older, who are working with financial advisors, this would be a common thing to hear from them. Um, a lot of this is due to the framework that they've been taught, um, which is basically a, a framework that everyone else uses, but doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's completely right. So we're going to go into um, one. So... The first one, fossil fuels are a necessary evil for performance. Let's look at the data. If that's true, let's check it out. Um, Jeremy Grantham uh, published some research uh, and he's from, if you're in investing, he's like on par with like just under Warren Buffett. I mean, a lot of people haven't heard of him outside of investing, but I mean, he's managing a hundred billion dollars. Um, he's incredibly famous and very well regarded. So he published the data from 1925 to 2017. We saw that divesting um, underperformed the market by 0.05%. It is almost the same. Um, but the thing that gets more interesting, so it's like over the last hundred years or so, it's almost the same. This is not including last six, right? So let's look at like what happens in the present. This is, so the blue line is, um, the blue line is the energy index and the green line is the S&P 500. And you'll see that the blue line is radically underperforming the market. This is like in a time of climate change, um, in a time of divestment movements, um, in a time where new technologies are coming in and eroding, uh, fossil fuels are no longer a valuable part of people's portfolio. Um, this was, there was a recent report that was just published on the Colorado Pension Fund which was short $2 billion in investment performance because it invested in, it continued to invest in fossil fuels and didn't listen to people about getting out of fossil fuels. That, that equated to $5,000 per, uh, almost $5,000 per pension year. That's a lot of money. All right, the second one, sustainable investors should expect lower returns. All right, so there's some higher returns that we're already talking about being baked in, but what about investing in the companies that are solving climate change? Here's the thing. Technological disruption happens quickly. This is one, this is probably my favorite slide of the whole presentation um, because we, we are in the middle of these two pictures right now. You know, we're living it. Um, it's hard to see though, because, you know, in on the left-hand side of the picture, you have New York City, 1900. You can't even spot the one car in the picture if that red circle wasn't around that. And then in 1913, right? I don't even know where the horse and buggy is, right? But those little incremental changes, they start to get faster and faster. And this is kind of our point. There's virtuous cycles and there's vicious cycles for businesses. This is uh, research borrowed from um, Rethink X. It's a think tank that we like. Um, they're so bullish on technology that they actually think we will solve climate change just from um, like economic reasons. Um, but there's some things that are happening, right? So 
virtuous cycles, more government support, more private investment, starting to get higher margins, higher revenues, lower cost, public acceptance, better capability, economies of scale, more variety. That's kind of happening in renewables, right? They had a public investment. They started to be more profitable. Green. What is SWB? Uh, so that that's like a re- their acronym for renewable system. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the vicious cycle, you're looking at um, the old energy system, right? So it's like reverse economies of scale, um, it loss of social, like all the way down to social license, right? This is what's happening. Like you wouldn't believe it reading the newspapers um, because you'll see like Exxon has record profits. And like, that's true. They have had record profits, but relative to other companies, they have lost 20 percentage points in market share. They like energy in the early 1980s used to be 25% of the market and now it's under five. When you think of the big stocks now, what do you think about? You think of like Apple, you think of Amazon, you know, you think of Google, right? These are the big companies now. And energy used to be be up there and they're no longer that kind of company. Um, and that's because there, there's economies of scale. Um, there's a great article in the New York Times talking about how fracking was a $300 billion boondoggle. Um, you know, this is getting into why it's so expensive to drill for oil. You know, you have things like the, the Steven Donziger case um, where he helped show what was going on in Ecuador and Chevron has a $26 billion uh, fine in Ecuador. Like those are huge liabilities. Those are huge costs to the business. It's not just that they're you know, ruining the planet, which they are. It's also that like that is a huge cost to the business. It's much harder to do business if you continue to do that. So breaking things down into fossil fuels, right? Um, 31% is in transportation and 28% is in electricity. This is like the size of their market, right? But the issue is in transportation, electric vehicles are better and cheaper, right? They, they're they faster, they're safer. You can charge them at home. Over time, they cost the same. I have, an, I have an, one electric car and one gas car. My electric car, I haven't taken in for service in the four years I've had it, right? So, and that's because it has fewer parts in its engine. It's a vastly superior technology. And this just gets in. I mean, this, this is also kind of a fun slide. You have like the the Ford Lightning. It's pulling, you know, I think it's like a million tons. Um, but there, there's more torque, they're more powerful. Um, they can power houses. They can be a backup battery. It allows for grid resiliency. Um, so they're just a lot better. So if you look at fossil fuels, and their big market is is was one of them is cars and transportation. You're seeing the cost come down. You're seeing that that's getting into electric cars will be cheaper to pr- produce. And this is what's happening. Sales globally are skyrocketing, and this is going to completely eat into their market share. The second piece of this is uh, electricity generation. Right in 2020, all of U.S. fossil fu- uh, it was 28 percent of all U.S. fossil fuel use. Um, and like, we need, we obviously need to radically drop the amount of fossil fuel use, um, to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's right now it's 25% by, by 2030 in electricity. Um, but elect in electricity, renewable solar wind, um, they have the economic tailwinds. And so what we're seeing is they're also scaling up exponentially. That's two different sectors where you're saying, these things are scaling exponentially. Isn't that the kind of graph that you would like to have in your investments as well? And when you when you factor in the fact that a warmer planet is bad for business, it's really not comparable. And so the last piece of this is like, when, as this pain is getting worse, um, legislation will, like, will come and has come. Um, the big one in the United States is we have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is basically tax credits and subsidies um, for us to buy, you know, induction ovens, electric cars, heat pumps, heat pumps, like I'm really excited about. Um, I live in Laguna Beach, which didn't used to need, um, it didn't need to, uh, air conditioning. So my house doesn't have air conditioning. So when I finally get my electric heat pump, I will have AC in addition to being more energy efficient. Um, and this is kind of like a story that I like, I'm excited about is like all these decisions are not just better for the environment, they're better for us. 
Like I get AC from doing this decision too. There's a lot of little things like this and legislation's coming around it. Europe is another place. Um, they have the carbon border tax, which is going to come up this year. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically they're putting um, a price on carbon. Um, so the amount of emissions you have, uh, you will get taxed on that. Uh, and they, I, I don't remember what Europe does with the fees. Um, but if you come from a country that doesn't have that tax and you import your goods, they will put a tax at the border to estimate that, that you have to pay so you're competitive inside their markets. So that is going to make um, European goods more competitive compared to the U.S. goods um, in, in the upcoming. So it would it would behoove us in the United States to, to have a carbon price as well. So in short, fossil fuels are being outcompeted in transportation, outcompeted in electricity, and they face significant legislative risks. You don't want that in a portfolio. So... When you're getting into building your portfolio, I wanted to walk you through a few tools. Again, building a portfolio, um, trying to do like an at like a like a 40 minute conversation, it may be a little complex. So if you have questions, I'll put my email, um, I'll put my LinkedIn. You can reach out to me anytime. Um, here's what we're seeing. If you remember the earliest slide, I showed you know Vanguard, but it's not just Vanguard, right? When you're looking for something, you want high impact, but you want like high diversification and low fees. And more or less what we're seeing is there are some high impact funds, but they're expensive. You know, you have some like neutral funds that are, they're cheaper and still kind of expensive. Um, and then you also have some ESG funds that are inexpensive, but like, what do they do? So a good example is uh, Vanguard has an ESG V um, uh, mutual fund, or it's, it's an ETF. Um, and that is something that you could put in your portfolio to represent your stocks. Um, it is largely divested, but other than it's not doing any voting, it's not over-invested in climate solutions. So it's like, it's hard to say how much impact it's having. So I want to walk you through some of these um, by those quadrants. So this gets into what we're talking about. These, this is not very much diversification. All of them have less than 1% of the total market. Positive impact though, right? I mean, they're investing in solar, global clean energy. Um, global clean energy usually is like solar, wind. Um, I think there's like also uh, like inverters and things like that that are in the portfolios. Um, their expense ratios are really high. So these, these funds are will only play like a small role in your portfolio. Um, and they're also like a, they're just mostly renewable energy. Um, climate funds, this is what we see. Um, a little more diversification. Before I got to Carbon Collective, Etho Capital was probably my favorite um, of these funds. This is what I used. Um, it's, you know, it has a, it tries to have the most sustainable companies in every industry that includes fossil fuels. Um, but I thought that was an interesting theory of change. So, and they keep quite a bit of the market. So impact, positive, neutral. Um, this one is like fossil fuel free, but it's small. Um, impact is neutral. Again, these are kind, they're kind of expensive. Aspiration. This one I don't think is a very good, um, uh, is a very good fund. Like it has like Reynolds wrap was like one of the largest holdings that it had. Um, I don't know how sustainable like having solo cups is. Um, so like it didn't really fit. So again, these are like the funds that could go in your portfolio. Um, on ESG funds, um, Vanguard has created the ESG V, um, excludes fossil fuels. It has, look at this, 40% of the market, right? That means you're getting a lot of diversification. Um, impact, neutral, negative. There's still a little bit of fossil fuels. They're not voting on shares. It's not much. Right. So uh, you have other versions of this, um, the low carbon, low carbon target ETF, 14 percent of the market, still a lot of fossil fuels, though. Um, and then engine number one, engine number one is actually the organization that got the board of, Sh of Exxon to have the three board members. But that's because they hold the funds of the fossil fuel companies. So they're investing them. They're getting people on, but we haven't seen much action. There's a world in which I had more slides in here to talk about this. So if you have questions at some point about why we don't think 
uh, shareholder advocacy there. Um, I can talk about that, but I cut it for time's sake. And then going into Betterment's climate impact portfolio, uh, I just wanted to use this portfolio to look at, this is what building your own portfolio could potentially look like. Um, so you're seeing that um, S&P 500, again, that's the big market. So that would have a lot of diversification. Um, and then they are doing a couple other things like a low carbon target ETF, right? So they're trying to, um, and then they have the bonds in here as well. Um, so, um, so that gives you, this gives you like a rough idea of what a portfolio could look like. Um, and this is actually the, like the role of the investment manager is to make sure your portfolio has all the right funds in it, is allocated correctly, which means it has a, the right percentage of of each fund in your portfolio that it aligns with your goals. Um, so a lot of people think about it, this is like just stocks and bonds. All right, let's do this. Um, one of the tools we like to use is fossil free funds. Um, that it's, you can look up anything in your portfolio with this and it will tell you what the carbon footprint of it is. Um, so that's something that we've looked at. Um, major companies that we've ended up seeing that were problematic, Berkshire Hathaway, this is owned by Warren Buffett, um, Duke Energy, Southern Power, like these companies like don't do well in 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 terms of uh, investing in climate solutions. But going into what we see in in that portfolio, like a good example of this is like when you start to look at something like an emerging market bond, and this is in the Betterment's climate impact portfolio. Why it's so hard to, for the fossil or for the financial services industry to invest in a climate friendly way is they just put in this emerging market bond and they're like, oh, this should be fine. But 38% of sovereign bonds are in like are issued from com countries whose main uh, export is fossil fuels, right? That's what their business is. You know, this is like Russia, Brazil. Um, this is looking at like the Middle East. These companies have a like, huge footprint. Um, and so, uh, and even there's like a large percentage of the companies uh, have fossil fuels as their main strategy. So when you start to boil it down, you're seeing that there's quite a bit of fossil fuels in these, um, like look at this, 45% of the bonds here are in fossil fuel, are lent to fossil fuel companies. Like that's crazy. That's in a climate impact portfolio. That's nuts. Um, so this is why like some of our conclusions we're building something around the average emissions and why we wanted to get it down. So we're down to um, the regular uh, investment is about uh, 65 um, tons of CO2 emitted per million dollar invested. And we're about 10. Um, I don't know why this went out of order again. Um, so again, this is what we're trying to charge is like, is some fees. That one went, that's so strange. I double checked that this morning too. Um, so I'll come back to those things. Um, so we wanted to give you tools in this section. So um, this is, if you want to have like a one fund, less bad portfolio, just set it, forget it. The ESGV, it gives you, you're not exposed to fossil fuel very much. Um, it's not very expensive. It's a large part of the market. Remember that like those three things, investing with the market, low fees, um, highly diversified. We want two funds. This starts to get into our theory of change, right? Um, because ESGV is divested and BlackRock, you start to invest in climate solutions. It's not all of them, right? But it's some of them, you know, and this is something you could put in your portfolio. Also, this would only be a stock portfolio. So if you wanted to add bonds in there, um, I could show you a fund that we like. It's this one right here, uh, Be Green. Um, if you wanted to add bonds in there, that would be a good one to go back and look at. Um, in a three fund portfolio, um, this would be adding two different or it, so it's like change research, not a lot of diversification in here, but there would be like a pretty good amount of, uh, of impact. There are not a lot of voting, um, uh, groups in here. So that's kind of interesting. So this gets into a carbon collective and I, I want to talk about like, so we saw all of this, what it takes to be a smart investor, you know? like low fee, high diversification, um, and investing with the market. 
We saw what it takes to solve climate change. We need to stop investing in fossil fuels, start investing in climate solutions. We saw like the reason why investing matters. You know, you have shareholder advocacy, cost of capital. Um, but we think a lot about shareholder advocacy. So this is this is really how we've boiled all of our conclusions down. Divest from the from the industries who can't exist in a zero carbon world. So this this means like energy, utilities, industrials, materials. Um, we reinvest that portion into climate solutions. Um, we took Project Drawdown as our main resource for climate solutions. They have 93 solutions to climate change listed on the website. Really cool stuff. It's like one of my favorite books. Um, I actually have like that one right there. Um, so, um, and we map it to the publicly traded markets. And so we end up getting, we had like over 400 companies and then we we believe money talks, obviously we're investing. Um, so we cut out all the companies that weren't making more, like at least 50% of their revenue from um, climate solutions. And then we pressure the rest. Right now we're starting with voting. Um, we have fairly large ambitions to go beyond voting to really introduce resolutions that are strategic around reducing emissions. And so that's our, our theory of change. Divest, reinvest, pressure the rest. I wanna share what that looks like in a portfolio. So for a portfolio, that's this would be probably pretty common for most everyone on the call. Um, you know, like maybe if you're my, I'm 40. So if you're my age and a little older, this would be a touch on the aggressive side from a financial advisor's perspective. I'm okay with that because I think I want to work 30 years. And um, so I'm comfortable with that. Um, but 80% stocks, um, we call this the 80 20 portfolio. It's eight, actually 18% bonds and 2% cash. So we can trade in and out of things. Um, so inside that, we'd have uh, almost, so it's like 18% in the climate index. Those are our companies that are solving climate change. We can look at it on our website. Um, 60, like a little more than 60%. These are low carbon econ economy ETFs. We're still investing in this broad market. So that's going to be, um, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. Um, we want to get more of those companies to become sustainable. Um, and they are, some of them are. 7.2% in green bonds and 10% in US treasury bonds. So that's how we build our portfolio. Um, we try to keep the same allocation over time because your portfolio will change because it will perform differently. So it gets all wobbly. So we're always kind of pruning it. I. I don't know why I've always imagined having a portfolio as like, like some sort of like hedge art in your backyard. Like if you keep growing your tree, like the tree gets really big, but if you want your hedge art, you have to keep pruning it. Um, that's a ridiculous metaphor. And I know that, but at least I get the visual. So I don't know if you get the visual as well. Um, we, we do offer something that we would not be able to offer um, inside 401k portfolio. This would be like, you know, major league baseball, all their, like all their employees would have a retirement plan. They would not have access to something like this because it won't pass a fiduciary test. It's not diversified enough, but a lot of people just want to be in, you know, climate solution um, companies. It's still fairly diversified because we have 194 uh, companies that are aligned with solving climate change in our ETF. Um, and uh, so we offer a climate only portfolio. So that a lot of people, they have issue with being invested in Amazon. They don't want to be invested in Amazon. I actually really understand that. Um, so we created that as well. Um, and what it comes down to is they're, they're diverse. They're inexpensive. Um, this is like how much you pay on fees um, and offer a similar level of risk and rewards, generic options. You can actually see here, we had a period of pretty significant outperformance. Our five-year models um, have showed that. And if you go back to that section of miss a sustainable investing, we're actually pretty bullish on the future. I don't think we'll we'll radically outperform the market, but but we do have a belief that fossil fuels will continue to be an anchor in people's portfolios. And so maybe we won't make the same mistake that the Colorado pension made and have $2 billion left. So that's that's kind of where we're at in, in creating that like smarter portfolio. Um and we also offer a 401ks for businesses. So um, this could be your university's retirement plans. It could be for like your baseball team's retirement plan. Um, this could be for uh, like if you have a company 
or like whatever it is, like we we can help with employer 401 case. Only all of this is only in the US. Um, if you are outside of the US, um, the one thing we may be able to help you with is our ETF. It's called CC So. I don't know which custodian platforms it's on um internationally. Um and it and I don't like I like I can't really go into like the any sort of pitch around that um, because for regulatory reasons. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, so with that, hit me up some questions. Awesome, Breen. And if you could just uh, take down the presentation so we can see each other, that would be awesome. Um, and uh, I know there's a lot of content. Any questions? Just go, no need to raise your hand. Um, although I see Jackie raising her hand. Um, I have kind of just a clarification question. There's something you said earlier in the presentation um, about the market share of energy can, of energy companies. Mm -hmm. You said that it went from 20% a few years ago to around 5%. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to wrap my head around what that means. So I'm like mostly yeah. a passive, I'm doing mostly passive investment. Yeah. I have mostly, um, uh, investments that follow like the general market. So yeah. how much, like I'm trying to understand how much like disinvestment from that energy sector would impact um, like how far off we would be from the market trend. Yeah. So those are, those are kind of two questions. And so can I tease them apart? So the first question is understanding the market share. And the second question is uh, like the technical term is called market tracking. Um, and tracking error. So it's like, how much are you following? What's happening now, right? So I wanna just address those separately. Um, market share would be like, if you added up all the companies in the S&P 500 and how much, how valuable they're all worth in the eight, in the early eighties, all the energy companies combined were about 25% of all of that. If you add up all the energy companies combined now, they're about 5%. So the amount, like, so that share of market has dramatically gone down because American business has, has become way more valuable in all these other parts of the, uh, all these other parts. Tech is a really like famous one. Uh, financial services have gotten a lot bigger, um, but this is where you see like the trends of market share. So, so that's the market share one. Um, market tracking, um, which is like that, that fancy term for, does it follow like what normal passive investing is? Um, let me, can, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen again one more time and just go over, uh, go over that. Okay. So market tracking is essentially this right here. So you see here, like, like we outperform and then here we underperform, right? We come back to the market, that gap gets smaller. Right. And that is about what we see. Um, and the best way to look at this is like the risk is very similar, but it's slightly different. The time in which the risk will hit. Um, so a good example of this is November 2021 to November 2022. Everyone's complaining about gas prices at the pump. That means um, the profits go up for Exxon. Right. Their share prices go up. Right. But we're divested from them. So it doesn't help our portfolio. That ends up being um, tracking error. And that and that's literally what closed the gap in our performance, right? And things like that may happen again. So we'll have some change, but if you look at the risk, it's very similar. So over time, it should do uh, behave like comparatively. Does, oh, does that answer your two yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah, it does answer my question. So like, yeah, even so, I was trying to understand the proportion, you know, with like the record profits in the oil industry. You're saying that does translate, but I also don't want to be a part of those record profits. I don't want to be contributing to them. So I don't your portfolio don't removes from that. that. Like yeah. why they got record profits is because Russia invaded Ukraine at yeah. a time when the supply chains were already messed up. So these are exogenous factors that they can't replicate. Like they can't scale more like big, you know, natural gas countries, like being jerks and invading other countries. Like that's just like, that's the worst business model. You know, yeah, and they also 
they also just announced that they're reducing their um yeah like the target investment in in renewable energy so lots of reasons yeah. to divest so okay cool yeah. thank you yeah of course all right anybody else i have one yeah. um uh so what i'm trying to understand is because you were showing the betterment um mm -hmm. as an example yeah. um and then at the end you brought in uh carbon collective mm -hmm. so is it almost like how so if i'm not if i'm an investor and i'm thinking of investing with my uh you know, climate solutions as my driver in my wallet, mm -hmm. you know, is, and if, if you could take the uh, slide down, cause I think it's easier for everybody to see. Yeah. Um, so my question is betterment, is it like, should we be looking at betterment versus the carbon collective approach and, and how do those, how do those differ? Yeah. Betterment being that... another, you know, I'm, I put it in the chat. It seems like they're claiming to be you know, not climate solutions. They don't use that language, but you know, climate impact fight. Yeah. 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 So I think that's a good, really good example. So Betterment is a great example of the financial services industry trying to, to create uh, a climate impact portfolio, right? It's still based on all of their investment paradigm. But when you look at how it measures on both impact and performance, we think it falls short and that's why we use it. It's a good model. I mean, we could have done the same with Vanguard or Wealthfront or any number other, or any people have financial advisors. A lot of financial advisors these days are trying to provide value in financial planning and tax and estate and those sorts of areas. So they're still all built off like similar thinking. Like this investment paradigm is, is baked into the financial services industry. It's what we want to challenge. My goal is like, this is a story that I want to change. I want you all to come away with the old way is not the smart way. And there's a new and better way that is better for the planet and for my portfolio. And then I'm going to, so I'm going to ask a question now and I'm taking the liberty of asking it on yeah. behalf of the younger investors here, the Ellis's yeah. of the world and the NCAA student athletes um, that we have. And I mean, and the athletes actually compared to me, all are younger investors. Um, anyway, <clears throat> can, you know, people with not a big portfolio invest directly in a carbon collective? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're just starting out in investing. Um, as long as you're US based, yes. Yeah, so we, we and, you know, so if you're a U.S. citizen, U.S. based, yeah, you can invest with us. Um, we are not available for international, you know, people who like German citizens, you know, so we're not available there. Um, the only the only place is some some uh, brokerages will like may have our ETF if you're out. of, And that would be the only way to to find and access us. So right now for like business, we, and American businesses, um, American investors, and we like, we'd be happy to help. And also like, I put my, my email and my LinkedIn, um, in the chat, like, like, please connect with me. I, I mean, I've talked to like student divestment groups at universities. Um, I have a friend who's a, who's a sustainability manager for an NBA team. Um, so like wherever you are, I've probably had a conversation rel like like relevant to what you may be wanting to to help do. Race car driving is new for me. I'll be honest, but, um, but EV race car. I mean, when you were I'm talking, excited about it when like, you were I'm talking about the now. auto industry. But... I'm looking at Ellis and I'm like, yeah, yeah, Ellis, uh, Ellis, Ellis. You know, quote unquote, pun intended, driving the future. Yeah, I love it. Sorry, I'll stop. It'd be uh, really cool to have you talk about how much better cars they are. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, I, well, I I didn't even realize as I'm going through the EV thing, I should just like handed it over to like Michelle and Alice. Be like, why are they so much better? And you could be like, they're <laughs> illegal in like the gas powered versions because they're so much better, right? Like, you can't do this. They're too good. 
Yeah, it was funny what you said. It like totally struck a chord. We both looked at each other at the very beginning. You said that, you know, when you're investing in climate friendly, you know, portfolio solutions, you're not giving up performance. And that's like our key message is like yeah. when you're driving electric, if anything, you're getting superior performance. Yeah. So performance yeah. on the planet all the way. Yeah. 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 I love it. I'm also thinking, I'm thinking out loud. And, and this again goes to the NCA student athletes, you know, current and recent grads. I wonder if there is an, as part of our eco athletes college initiative, is there, you know, using the power of athletes to pressure uh, divestment, like as a as a spe, you know, as a, a unique, distinct group athletes for divestment. Um, I say that as a question. Don't necessarily have the answer just yet, but I think it's maybe worth exploring. Yeah, I think it's actually interesting you mentioned that because Stanford was like, I think this was last year or two years ago, they were thinking about divesting from fossil fuel companies and getting funding from them. And even for the new sustainability school we have, yeah, ultimately like decided to go against that and accept fossil fuel funding. But that mm -hmm. caused a lot of like, I don't know, objections and um, protests within the school. And I actually, I wrote a paper early on about divestment, but- Oh, email yeah. it to me. <laughs> I don't know if it's good enough. That was my freshman- No, 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 no. I want to read it. I've evolved a lot since then and learned a lot. No, but, no, um, Rebecca. Like the, this, is, this is not a, coming from a place of judgment. Um, one of the things that I really love seeing is like people's evolution, right? Because they're they're- like there are other people that are starting the journey that you were on when you wrote that paper that would love to read that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I always like to see like how people get there, I, I, but I would love to read it. Okay. I'll send it to you. I can't promise anything good, but yeah, it's definitely something I'm really interested in. So I thought it was interesting yeah. that you talked about that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. Any also, other I'm sure Michelle can attest to this, but your parents are probably the most underrated people you can influence. Like, like, I'm not kidding. Like if I, so in my family, I'm considered young, right? Like I know I'm older than all of you all, um, mm -hmm. but I have parents that are in their early seventies. And it's like, when I do something, I'm still con like, I'm still considered young and cool. Um, you know, I, I, like, I don't know how that is, but I am. Um, and I'm by 70 year olds, it's like a low bar. Um, but yeah, like when I talk to them about stuff, they were like, oh, this is awesome. You know, and but if their friends had told them, there's no way they would have listened to them. I was not so even, I was never, I was never, I was never young and cool even when I was young. Ah, Lou, but we love you anyway. I and thought it was really funny when you mentioned the heat pump because, so yeah, with my studies and everything, I, my dad has definitely gotten into sustainability a lot more. And he's a professor, so he's been starting to teach more in that as well. And then at home, he installed a heat pump. And when you said you were excited about it, I was just laughing because I thought of him, how excited he was when he installed it. And he sent in the family chat and was like, look at how cool this is. When you like, get to be a homeowner, you get excited about incredibly boring stuff. I refinanced at a great mortgage rate. I got a heat pump. Like, you know, I have an induction oven. Like, and people are like, wow. Like, my friends are like, I get it. Like, I want that too. Dude, you're, you're sounding like Dr. Like, sounding what like is Dr. You? You're sounding like Dr. Rick. Oh yeah. I'm, so that's for the I, Americans. That's a commercial campaign um, <laughs> about you know when how you turn into your parents when you become a homeowner. Oh yeah, totally. Which is uh, it, 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 it's, it's a lifestyle thing. Um, if there aren't any more questions, like I just like the thing I want to stress most is like in addition to solving climate change being better for you, like immediately, like that, that being our belief, it's also an amazing community. So if you want, I've had a lot, a lot of people are in college right now on this call. Um, there's a whole world about getting jobs at solving climate change. If you have any questions about that, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I went from traditional finance into carbon collective, um, which is deeply meaningful for me. Um, and I'm really exciting. So just whatever it is, like, I, I would really like to help, like, like, you know, and this community is great. I think Lou can attest to that at Climate Week. It's just, there's a recognition of how large this problem is, but how much opportunity there is to work on it. And like, I, I'm here for y'all.
That's a, I do uh, have one question, if that's yeah. okay. I know, go, yeah. go for it, Elena. Um, so, uh, and I'm not sure how far this is off investing, um, because my question is like when, when we're choosing a bank, when we have like mm. savings in a bank and mm. that money is being invested by the bank, yeah. like is the, our only option really like finding a bank that can align with climate or like, uh, w yeah, with, with the money that's in a bank, what are our options for that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great question. Um, I, I mean, I talk with a lot of people on this side of the equation too. Um, one of the best places to evaluate a bunch of banks is, uh, mighty deposits. Um, a bank that I know of um, and uh, I like the people at is called uh, Atmos Financial. Um, they, the thing that they do is like they use all their deposits and they lend it out to companies solving climate change. Um, I, uh, I also like, I also like um, credit unions because the way they use their money is in the community. And that tends to be like divested from fossil fuels and doing good things in their community. So those are other good options. Um, and if you need like a big bank, uh, First Republic has been divested since 2016. Um, and they, they my, like my family had a small business. We had an ad agency. So we use that bank. So I'm really familiar with great customer service. So depends on what you need. Um, those, are, those, are some, uh, those are some good options for you. Breen, what was the first one you mentioned at? Mo uh, Mighty Deposits is the, is a, uh, Mighty, I'll put it. It's uh, sure and all right, there we go. Mighty deposits is the resource, Atmos Financial and First Republic is like if you need a big bank um, that does like, you know, has all the services because Atmos doesn't have all the services yet, but they're, they're a good bank um, for the lending and then credit unions are also good. And then uh, on the other flip side of it, I saw one of your uh, slides where you said, do they hold Chase? Do they hold Exxon? Chase being one of... I mean, the big four, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're the largest financiers of fossil fuel extraction in the world, like probably should avoid them. Yep. And um, so I moved out of uh, Chase because uh, I didn't know that was the case until actually yeah. Climate Week NYC. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, any Hi, other? Joe. Yep, it's time. I, I, uh, we we've gone past time. Both, Breen, thank you so much for your. Yeah, time. of course. Reach out if you have any questions, though. Like this is not the end. This is the beginning. And thank all of you all for being part of this. And um, uh, you know, I, you know, we can continue the conversation. I think there's uh, there's ideas flowing in me for eco athletes as to how we can use the power of you guys to accelerate the transition to smarter, cleaner investing. So somewhere in there is another thing. Um, and so I hope this was uh, informative and worthwhile for you guys. Awesome. Thanks, great. Thank, Thank you. you. And have a great uh, have a great day, night, wherever you are. Um, and uh, uh, Rebecca, hit them straight. I'll try. <laughs> all right. Bye. Right. Talk to you all later. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, Jackie. Hello. Hey, Brent. What'd you think? It was great. I'm gonna follow up with him.